Uh, good evening, everybody. Welcome to Virtual Conduct. Uh, we're going to get started here in just a few minutes, but I just wanted to get the stream going and say hi to everyone. If you're in the chat there, go ahead and go ahead and drop a little hi message. Just let us know you're you're hanging out, uh, so we we know uh, we know that you're here, and we'll we'll get rolling in a second. So in the meantime, the rest of you hanging out, these are some things you can do. You can uh, go to uh, Conduct on a Twitter, give a Conduct a follow. Uh, also on Facebook, and if you go to conduct.org, that link there in the in the middle left, that'll actually take you to the same place as this link right here, this much longer meetup link that I'm trying not to block. But you can go go there and uh, join the join our meetup so you get notified about upcoming events and uh, details about the events, where the events are going to be. These virtual events, especially, they've they've been all hosted here on on my Twitch, but that may not always be the case. We may move to other Twitches, or we may move to other uh, tools if we need to. So you want to make sure you follow and subscribe to all the things here so you'll know all about that when it, uh, when it comes up. So I'm seeing some people hanging out in the chat, but no, no messages yet. Let me just, uh, can you all hear me? If you can hear me, just say something in the chat. Let's just make sure the sound is working. Oh, I see someone. Trexno2 can hear me. Great. Glad, glad you're here, Trexno. We'll get started here in eh, maybe three or four minutes. Just got done watching an ad. Oh, mm, maybe that's what's going on. Yeah, I got those affiliate Twitch affiliate ads going. Howdy, Lambert. Lambert Picks, what's going on? Uh, one thing I guess I can mention while we're just sort of chatting here, if you have uh, not put a chat message in yet, you probably want to do that uh, because it'll automatically enter you to win a prize drawing at the end of the session today. Uh, so you want to make sure to do that. Uh, so if you don't have a Twitch account and you want to get entered to that and you want to, you know, ask questions of our speaker, the Twitch chat is the place to do it. So if you haven't yet uh, signed up, now's the chance for you to do that. You don't have to sign up to watch, but uh, if you want to participate in the chat, win some prizes, this is the way to go. Huge, says Trekno2. <laughs> Got my couch base swag package, by the way. Oh, good. I'm glad you got that. That was the second prize from last month. Is that right? Yes. I've got I've got some more stuff. I, I'm not sure what I can. I'm I'm just kind of running low on on the my my stock here. But I've got I've got some more stuff. I've got another one of those bags, I think, and tons of stickers. Hey, to Hanson four three two zero six. Hello from Columbus. That is a Columbus area zip code. If I ever saw one. Four three two zero six. I'm in the four three one two three, and I grew up in the four three one three zero. Our our speaker Cameron standing by here, listening to me spout out zip codes. I'm sure it's absolutely riveting. Ripping four three zero eight two. I don't know. I don't know what those zip codes are. I don't actually know them that well. <laughs> just just my own that I've lived in. Dave B. Codes just signed up. Oh, cool. Glad you're here, Dave B. Codes. That's a pretty cool name, Dave B. Codes. Westerville is 43206. 43201 represent. I like this. I like this whole everybody spouts their zip code into the chat. <laughs> oh, man. This is becoming a trend. 43065. First time after getting your Twitch account. I like it. JW 8636. 8686. Sorry. All right, it's about five after here, so I'm going to get started on the main slide deck. Let's do it. Let's make it happen. So welcome to Conduct. Make sure to go and follow on Twitter, 
sign up for meetup there. That conduct.org link will go right to this long meetup link right here. So either one will work, but the conduct.org one's easier to type. So go there. We got 43140, we got 43065. Wow, I love the zip code thing. Uh, go to Facebook and like and subscribe there. And just make sure to, uh, you know, get yourself plugged in so you know when the next meetup's going to be, who's going to be presenting, uh, where it's going to be presented. Uh, Twitch seems to be the de facto place so far, but that is always subject to change. So just uh, keep that in mind. All right, uh, our normal in kind sponsor that provides us a meeting space that we can't use right now, but I keep giving a shout out because uh, they were always so good to us. So I want to give them another shout out to G2O. Thank you for providing our meeting space. I believe they've moved offices since the, our last meeting. Uh, so when we meet in person again, uh, who knows where it's going to be. Uh, but I uh, just want to give them a, a shout out and say thank you for that. Uh, our, our raffle sponsors again are JetBrains. Uh, that'll be our grand prize. We'll give a JetBrains license today. There'll be some good stuff there. And Couchbase as well. So I'll have a nice uh, Couchbase uh, swag package, some, some stickers, uh, like a messenger bag and a notebook and all kinds of other stuff. I'll put it all in a box and I'll send it to you uh, to the second, second place winner. Just enter your message in the Twitch chat and you'll be entered automatically. You must be present to win at the end of the session tonight. Some other groups in the area that are still meeting, Central Ohio Azure Group, they are still meeting second Monday. Not at Microsoft Office, but they're meeting virtually, I believe, with uh, Teams. So you want to go check that out at coazure.org. Columbus AppDev User Group, also still meeting virtually on uh, Teams and or Twitch. Last time I checked, uh, you can go check them out. That's the third Monday every month if you want to check out all the cool stuff they're doing at the AppDev User Group. Uh, Pass is also still meeting virtually, columbus.sqlpass.org. Definitely want to go and check that one out. That's the second Thursday of the month, I believe. And there's their website. The Let's Talk IT Columbus group. So this is the uh, user group for non-technical skills that IT professionals need. Uh, you can go check this out there. It's meetup.com slash let's-talk-it-columbus. We need to shorten that URL maybe. Uh, or, or maybe uh, someone could type it up there in the chat. I would appreciate that. But uh, you want to check that group out. They're still meeting virtually. They've got a next meeting coming up on September 2nd. So you want to go and check that out for sure. And if you'll indulge me, uh, Connect Online is also coming up. This is a free event. If you're interested in NoSQL, couch-based products and tools and things like that, it's a totally free event, totally free virtual. Sign up for that. Lots of great content for developers across all kinds of ecosystems, including .NET. And and I, because I've been involved in this, I know there's some great swag and prizes that are available for this. So you definitely want to sign up for that. If you use this link right here, uh, they will actually give me a, a free pizza for everyone who signs up using my link. I'm just kidding about that. But I would appreciate if you want to sign up for that uh, event, go to here, bit.ly slash connect register, or you can use the QR code if you want to sign up for that event coming up in October. We don't have uh, any plans to meet in person yet still. Uh, we haven't really discussed that all recently. We're just staying virtual um, for now. Um, we've got uh, just Cameron Presley on the docket for now. We've got a few other ideas for speakers. Some of them have fallen through. Um, we're still looking for suggestions for speakers for .NET or .NET adjacent topics. Or if you want to speak, uh, you can uh, contact me. Uh, my email address will be on the screen here shortly. It's, uh, I'll just also put it in the channel here. It's me at mgroves.com. Feel free to email me if you have a suggestion or if you want to speak as well. Um, uh, but uh, so that's kind of our, our uh, agenda right now. I don't know about the holiday party in December. No idea what that's going to look like. I've got some ideas, but who knows what's going to happen in, by December. Um, we'll see. But anyway, that's uh, we're looking to fill the next two slots, September and October. And, and of course, November It's usually right around Thanksgiving. So we don't have one scheduled for that. All right, uh, if you are looking for work or if you are hiring, we usually ask you to raise your hand in person. We don't have that. You are absolutely welcome to use the chat uh, to talk about uh, your company hiring or talk about if you're looking for a position. The chat is completely open to you. If you are uncomfortable doing that because it is kind of a public place, that's totally fine. You can email me and I will make the connection. So I've been doing that a little bit behind the scenes Connecting people with recruiters who are looking for a position or uh, looking, people who are looking for a position with recruiters. 
So you can absolutely uh, do that uh, in the chat or in the email, whatever you're comfortable with, totally fine. Uh, you can be part of the team. If you want to uh, give us a hand, uh, we can always use some help finding speakers. Uh, if you want to host the stream, if you have ideas, uh, if you want to help update the website, all those sorts of things, uh, you can, uh, again, email me, me at or if you know these other people on this list here, you can contact them as well, and they'll be uh, happy to help. Uh, so if you're new to Twitch, you're new to Condug, new to any of this, uh, all you got to do is, if you're looking at a desktop, there's a little chat box there in the, in the bottom right. kind of looks like that. See where the red arrow points? That's where you enter your, your chat messages, your questions, your comments, anything you want. Uh, and I will be monitoring this chat during the presentation. And uh, Cameron has said that he will have some spots during his presentation where he'll, he'll, he will pause and ask for questions. And I will relay those to him uh, audibly. So uh, just get those into the chat, and I'll be watching that and uh, monitoring that along the way. Okay, that's it. So again, make sure to follow on social media and all those places. I'm going to turn off the slides here. I'm going to bring up on the screen my Zoom window, and let's get a quick sound check from you, please, Cameron. You're now visible. Okay, uh, there you are, Cameron. So now you're visible, and uh, we hopefully be able to hear you. So uh, maybe you could just give us a quick sound check. Make sure the volume is okay. Yeah, Matt, how do I sound? Sound pretty good? Hear me okay? Sounds good to me. Anybody else in the chat there? Could you let, us, let me know if it's uh, loud enough or if uh, one or both of us need to up the volume? How's it sounding out there? Do we need to pump up the jam? M. Bolin sounds great. Trexno says he sounds, quiet. he sounds good. Maybe a little quiet. Okay, I will pump up the volume a little bit. Okay, can we give us another uh, another sound check there, Cameron? Good evening. This is Cameron here to teach you about some functional programming concepts. Listen to those dulcet tones. How's that sounding? A little better out there? Much better, he says. Okay. Well, I will take myself off the screen and hand it over to you, Cameron, and uh, I'll be monitoring the chat for questions. All right. Excellent. Thanks, Matt. Appreciate it. Good evening, everyone. Hopefully you're here to learn about some functional programming through first principles. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, so first things first, um, for tonight's presentation, you will not need to take any notes. All Everything you're gonna see here, the slide deck, code samples, resources, all of it is already live. If you scan the following QR code or uh, go to the meetup page, you'll actually find these resources have already been posted. So uh, no need to take notes unless you just really absolutely want to. So with that being said, let me uh, introduce myself very quickly. Um, as mentioned before, my name is Cameron Presley and I'm a lead software engineer for a company called Century One. Uh, if you've ever had to deal with SQL Server and wondered, why is it running so slow? Why is my query so bad? Oh goodness, why is it doing what it's doing? We probably have something that can help you out. Um, in addition to that, I am a Microsoft MVP. All that means is I do stuff with the community. I'm not affiliated with Microsoft. I'm not even a technical expert in all the things, just some of the things. Uh, director of speaker relations for a tech conference based out of Knoxville called CodeStock that you know, potentially may have heard of us and run a couple of user groups related to functional programming in particular functional Knox. So what we'll be covering this evening so we're going to start with functional programming at like the barest of levels. And first we're going to introduce you to this thing known as the Mars Rover Kata. Um, it's a small program that we're gonna be building um, essentially from scratch this evening. That's going to cover some of the fundamental concepts starting with this idea of immutable data models, right? How do we deal with these immutable data structures and, um, and some of the benefits they provide? Following that, we'll start taking a look at functions and implementing all these business rules as functions and determining why, why do we care about that, right? What's so important about pure functions? And with that in mind, we'll then follow it up with this idea of composition, this idea that you can build bigger programs from smaller programs, right? So wonderful. With that in mind, let's go ahead and get started and take a look at the Mars Rover problem itself.
So you give it a couple seconds here for things to catch up a little bit. But at a high level, the kata is the following. You are part of a development team that's exploring the surface of Mars uh, by sending these remote controlled vehicles to the surface of the planet. Our development job is that we need to create an API that can take the commands that we send uh, from Earth to be interpreted by this rover as a series of instructions. So with this kata in mind, there's a couple of requirements we need to keep in mind here. Like any good problem, uh, the devil's in the details. Um, first and foremost, when we're working with this rover concept, it always starts at zero, zero and facing uh, the north direction. Speaking of directions, valid directions look like the following. You can either be facing north, facing south, facing east, or facing west. So, so far, so good. And uh, the possible commands that a rover can take are some of the following. Uh, a rover knows how to move forward, it can move backward, knows how to turn left, it knows how to turn right, and it knows how to shut down and quit. Um, so with this in mind, with these bare level requirements in the problem description, we can go ahead and start thinking about modeling this problem. So one thing that you can do to start thinking about data modeling in general is you can look at the problem description and start thinking about the nouns, right? What are the nouns of the problem. And so, so far it seems like we have three nouns. We have this idea of a rover. We don't know everything that's in it, but we also have this concept of a direction and a command. So I don't know about you, but when I'm modeling my software, I wanna model it in such a way that things don't break, right? I want to model it such that the developer can't create uh, an invalid state or an invalid system. So based on what we've talked about with direction and command so far, we can kind of uh, model these by using a built-in uh, data type in C-sharp known as the enum. Go ahead and get the slides catch up there a little bit, yeah. So we talked a little bit about this, but for the command, right, it can only be move forward, move backward, turn left, turn right, and quit. And for directions, those are the four directions, north, south, east, So that's two of the three models. Let's look at this third data model, the rover. So uh, we said originally that our rover started at zero, zero facing north. By definition, that implies that um, it's gonna have an integer X value, an integer Y value, and a direction for uh, you know, the direction it's facing. But we already run into our first little snag. Given this data model, how do we enforce that the X property, Y property, and direction properties are set? Right now, there's no way to force that. And that's kind of problematic because we know that for this rover to exist, it has to have some type of initial state. Well, one way we could approach the problem is updating the rover a little bit by adding this constructor like so. Let's see if uh, Highline will pick up here on Twitch. Wonderful. Yeah, so by adding a constructor like this, we are telling uh, consumers and developers, hey, if you're gonna create this rover, you have to specify an X value, a Y value, and a direction. And if you don't give me those three things, I won't even compile for you. Pretty good approach. We're already designing a system to make sure that the developers are doing the right thing. And that's a good thing, right? By making these changes, we're forcing developers to do the right thing. And that should always be the, uh, a good thing, correct? Well, maybe. Let's take a look at this. So let's pretend that we've got some code that looks like the following. Um, it's a method called log rover, and it takes in this rover type. It writes something to the uh, console window, but then it's got this really interesting spot right here where we can actually take that rover value, take its X and increment it by one. Well, that's not super intuitive, right? Especially when I see the method signature up above for log rover of type void. So based on the signature and based on the name, I wouldn't expect this method to make any changes to Rover, but it totally is. This is an example of surprising code because it's not doing what I would expect it to do. And I don't really want developers to be able to do things I, the code wasn't designed to do. So what are some things that we could do to prevent this from happening, right? And, and I'm gonna elaborate a little bit on why this is such a problem for Log Rover for a moment. So the reason why this is such a huge problem is that if I call log rover with 
this rover type, X is being incremented under the hood. So if I call log rover five times, that X value keeps incrementing, right? So the first time it will be maybe zero, zero facing north and uh, one zero facing north and so on and so forth. That's bad, we don't like that. So, and the, and the problem is, is that uh, I've got get set on my properties, right? So I can make changes anywhere in the code and that's a problem. So what I can do is I can actually remove the set values from the properties and define the class like such. Just by doing this, I've prevented engineers and other developers to make changes to this object with, throughout the application. And if they wanna make changes, they have to create a brand new Rover. Now, I'm not gonna lie to you, trying to enforce this in C Sharp today is uh, painful to say the very least. But um, if you were able to catch MS Build this year, or if you've been keeping an eye on the .NET blogs, you'll note that in C Sharp 9 and coming out in .NET 5, we have this new record type, um, which, uh, which pretty much does all this stuff for you under the hood and then some, and it gives you a much nicer syntax of working with immutable data structures, which is pretty nifty. So with that in mind, the minute we make that change to Rover such that you have to specify an X value, a Y value and SUT and uh, X value, Y value and a direction. Um, and we still want to increment Rover. We have to update our signatures like this now. If, um, and really quick question for the um, uh, audience. Are you noticing a pretty big lag between my voice, what I'm talking about in the slide deck? Just wanna make sure that um, I'm keeping in sync there. All right, I'll, uh, I'll poke at Matt a little bit. Uh, Matt, how are things on your end? Everything looking? Okay, cool. So, cool. Uh, excellent. I'm watching the Twitch stream myself and I'm noticing there's a decent lag. So I'm just making sure that we're doing okay here. But if it looks smooth to you, then we'll keep going. Yeah, everyone's saying it's fine. Uh, everything seems fine here. Wonderful. So cool, I'll chalk it up to a bad uh, cell network and we'll keep going. So with making Rover immutable now and setting it up that way, if I want to change Rover, I've got to make I've got to make some type signature changes, right? If I want to modify Rover, I've now got to return it, right? Return new Rover with the X value incremented. And now that means the signature for the log Rover method also is a Rover, which is really cool because it, it makes the code more obvious what it's doing, right? If I if I'm calling the log Rover method and it's returning back a Rover, I'm gonna go ahead and start scratching my head a little bit and go, what in the world is it doing such that it needs to return a new one? That's giving me a hint that maybe it's modifying state under the hood and that may be something I should be careful of. Whereas before with the void method signature, I was immune, I didn't know it, right? So it kind of gets rid of this surprising code, which really hits one of the key fundamental concepts in functional programming, this idea of immutability. Right, And so if we look at the definition of immutability, it tells us that an object um, whose state cannot be modified after it's created. And you're probably thinking, um, dang it, Cameron, uh, if, if, it can't, if state can never be changed, how do we update stuff, right? How do we do it? Well, the reason, the way we update state is by creating new objects and we pass those uh, things around. And you'll see examples of that a little bit later in the presentation. And the reason why this is important is because it's really hard to keep track of state throughout an application, right? How many of y'all have been taught at the very beginning that um, global state is bad, right? You don't like pulling out global values out of nothing. Well, now imagine that you're working an application that's multi-threaded or there's multiple things going on at once. Much harder to keep track of. So by limiting the amount of what can be changed, um, um, so if you want to uh, limit uh, how much you have to keep track of, limit that mutability, right? Limit where code can change at. And this is kind of important because the reason, the minute you have immutability, all of a sudden the rest of functional programming works. The minute you get rid of immutability, a lot of these rules fall apart and you'll see in the next couple of slides. So with that being said, are there any questions in the chat so far? So far, nothing, uh, no questions in the chat there, Cameron. Wonderful, thanks, Matt. So let's go talk about oh, rules on. and functions and how we got. We got this. one, someone's got a question here. Excellent, waiting, all right, cool, what do we got? Waiting for them to type it out here. <laughs> uh, 
Excellent. And, by the way, you don't have to wait for Cameron to prompt to ask your questions. Go and throw them in oh, the chat please. there, and I will collect them basically along the way. Yes, please. Life, uh, all, all the questions. Um, so for sure. So now we're all going to wait on this person to put their yes. question in the channel. Yes. It's all. No pressure checks, no. Don't make a typo now. <laughs> Inquiring. Like, <laughs> inquisitive minds are wanting to know. Oh, goodness. We're putting way too much pressure on a map. <laughs> I'll tell you what. We'll keep. Oh, there we go. Say we're gonna keep, yeah. Okay. So here's the question. Wouldn't the console right line on the previous slide uh, move the rover or just give you a different location that's incorrect? Uh, so I'm assuming we're talking about the, oh, due to the plus one. Yeah. So um, in the previous example, uh, I'm assuming you're talking about with the fix where we changed the signature. So with the change of the signature, console still writes the way it, it it's going to. It's still going to log whatever was passed in. And that returned rover, I could throw it away. I could not have to use it. But if I were to hold on to it and then pass that again as input, that could cause a problem. So um, problem being the fact that it's getting a new value, but that's okay because um, console is still writing what the value of rover was at that time. And if I return a new one, I'm I have to either hold on to it or throw it away. Um, and if I'm not, and if I'm still not quite answering the question correctly, hold on to it and we'll come back because I think as we see some of the rest of the slides, it may help you out a little bit. All right, thank you. I think that's the only question we have for now. Nice. Okay. Cool. So let's let's take a look at some of the business rules and see how we can implement them as functions. So business rules for moving forward. So if a rover is going to move forward. Uh, what changes actually depends on the direction it's facing. So if the rover's facing north um, and you're told to move forward, then its Y value is going to increase by one. If it's facing south, it'll go, the Y value uh, will decrease by one. And then it's very similar logic for both east and west. So with that in mind, what's kind of interesting is when we design this function, it's based on the state of the rover. And because we have immutability, that means we have to create a new rover with an updated X or Y value. So let's take a look at what this means at a high level without diving into code immediately. So a good way to think about this is that we can, so pretend this circle is all rovers. It represents all possible rovers, all possible configurations. And let's say the second circle also uh, is the representation of all rovers. Well, for all rovers that are facing north, I can map them to all rovers that have a Y value that's been incremented by one. And we'll, and we'll call that mapping move forward, okay? We can do something very similar. For all rovers that are facing south, when they're mapped over, they're gonna be in the rovers where their Y value had been decremented by one, and so on and so forth for east and west accordingly. So now that we've kind of have this mapping in place, let's actually look at this. Are there any directions in that first group that aren't mapped at all? As in, like, is there anything in the left circle that doesn't have an arrow to the right circle? No, they, they all seem to be mapped. Awesome. Well, let's ask the second question now. Is there any direction in the first group that when mapped actually goes to one of two different like uh, outputs in the second circle? No, and that's, and that's a really good thing, right? So that means um, if I'm facing north, that means rover should always, uh, rover's Y should always go up by one. It's not sometimes goes up by one, sometimes goes down by one. That's kind of important, especially when it comes to repeatability and unit testing. So let's look at that into that a little bit more. So we've kind of talked around this a little bit, but like what's a function, right? Like what do we mean by that? So um, from mathematics and such, a function is a mapping between two sets such that every element in the first set maps to a single element in the second set. Now, Cameron, and now you may be looking at me and be like, Cameron, this sets, we don't do sets. I'm not a mathematician. Cool. You may not be, but you know what? You are a developer, which means you probably deal with types. So think about a function is that it's just a mapping between two types where every element in the first type has to go to an element in the second type. Uh, let's take a look at some examples that aren't in the rover kata. So let's take a look at days in a month. So let's say I've got a group of months uh, like the following, right? So it's got all 12 months. 
And let's say I've got a second grouping for the number of days. And we know that all months have either 28, 29, 30, or 31 days. And so let's start taking a look at the mapping. Well, March has 31 days, pretty straightforward. So does January. April has 30 days. But February is interesting in the fact that it depends, right? Sometimes it's 28 days in the month. Sometimes it's 29. And because of this relationship, this actually isn't a function because for the input of February, it could get mapped to one of two values, right? The reason why you as a developer wouldn't want this is means that your code's not repeatable. That means sometimes it gives you an answer. Sometimes it gives you a different answer, which is not so great, right? Let's take a look at another example of mappings that also don't follow the rules of a function. So let's say that we were wanting to take uh, integers and map it to a month, right? So I've got the set of all integers, so one, two, and I include 13, but it could have went to infinity for all intents and purposes. And now let's say I've got a group of all the month names. So January, February, dun, 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 all the way to December. Well. Not too bad, one goes to January, two goes to February, so on and so forth, 12 goes to December. Oh no, where does 13 go to? Anybody wanna take a guess what you do with 13? Feel free to uh, put it in the chat. If not, Matt will uh, gratefully tell me what, what will happen if I put in 13 and try to figure out what month goes to number 13. Uh, I'm gonna guess an exception. Yeah, you probably are gonna get an argument exception or null or some other terrible, terrible thing, right? So the problem is, that this isn't a great function because for all integers, not all of them go to a month name. So it's not a function. And this is where um, a type system can kind of lie to you a little bit, right? Because if I try to write a function that says for any number, I give you back a month name, eh, not true, right? So you as developer have to be a little bit more careful about that. So that's why thinking about functions in this way is very important. And that has to follow both these rules. And if not, we're gonna have a really bad time. So um, going back uh, to move forward, right? This is what we had, right? If it's facing north, y goes up by one, south, y goes down by one, east, x goes um, up by one, so on and so forth. So let's take a look at how we would have implemented this in C-sharp. So we have a, a public stack method called rover, oh, sorry, that returns a rover called move forward. We do a switch statement on the direction, and then depending on what direction it's facing, it will return you a new rover. Um, now, for those of you keeping track at home, you're probably looking at with Y of and with X of and going, what the heck is that, Cameron? That's a little bit of boilerplate code I wrote to use with an immutable um, rover, that data type, this, some extension methods. If you're really curious about what those look like, you can always find them in the GitHub repo that goes along with this presentation. Um, with the new uh, .NET 5 and C Sharp 9 record syntax, you don't even need those extensions methods. It gets a lot simpler which is pretty nifty. But but we have a, a function that is solely dependent upon the rover passed in. It always will give you back a rover. It doesn't throw exceptions. It doesn't sometimes do one thing, sometimes another, it's consistent. And the reason why we care about this is, um, I don't know about you, but I hate debugging code that's, that's inconsistent, right? How many of y'all have ever had to try to reproduce an issue and it sometimes bubbled up? right? That sucks. It's not fun. So writing these functions is a lot, it's a lot easier to troubleshoot, right? It's helpful. The other reason why these functions are important is because I want to know if I'm doing things where the types line up. Now, if you're a .NET developer, you're probably used to Visual Studio or VS Code telling you, hey, buddy, you forgot to put a semicolon here. And that's fine. But I'd much rather the compiler tell me, hey, wait a minute, you didn't cover all your cases or hey, wait a minute, this isn't gonna do what you think it's gonna do. I'd much rather the compiler tell me that. Okay, and at this junction, let's uh, let's uh, check the Twitch stream, see if there's any questions so far. Uh, so far, no questions that I can see in the chat. Wonderful, excellent. All right, well then we'll just keep this ball rolling. So we've got uh, moving forward um, so we can take a, and so uh, moving forward and moving backward are very similar to one another. So I'm going to skip ahead a little bit and look at when turning left. So turning left is interesting because once again, it's based on the direction you're facing, but what happens is that your X and Y coordinates are going to stay the same, but the direction you're now going to be facing changes. So if you're uh, facing North and you turn left, you're going to be facing West, 
so on and so forth as we go around the compass. So let's use this tech, this same trick again, where we do the circles and figure out how does this mapping gonna look like? So we've got Rover and here's that circle for Rover and we've got another circle for new Rovers. And if we've got all Rovers facing North, that means they're gonna get mapped to Rovers now facing West. Rovers facing South will get mapped to facing East and so on and so forth. Not too bad, right? Not, not too bad at all. In fact, this looks so similar that you probably already have a guess of what the turn left method looks like. Looks like the following. Given a rover, we'll do a switch on the direction and then based on its direction, we are turning a new rover with an updated direction. Not too bad. So at this junction, you we have a way to create rover. We have uh, valid uh, directions, valid commands. And we've implemented enough logic to do move forward, move backward, turn left, turn right. That's most of the business rules. Sweet, not too bad. And uh, I don't know about you, but the unit testability of all this code so far, pretty succinct, right? Either you just create a rover facing the right direction and just do asserts that it's X and Y values are and or direction have been updated correctly. Um, and given the way we define command um, um, direction and commands, you can't really give us a bad one. Compiler really won't let you do it. So I, I like the fact that we're writing code where uh, developers have to try really, really hard to mess up, which is nice. Uh, I like the joke in the chat about where, unless you're at the North Pole, then every direction South, absolutely. So at this point, We've learned pure. We've learned about pure functions, or sorry, functions in general. Why those are important. We've learned about good data modeling and immutability. Let's uh, let's talk about user interactions now. So we've got all the business rules, but we actually want somebody to use our application, right? Because that's kind of the whole point. So what does a workflow look like for a uh, for an end user? So. For this Kata, we are implementing it as a console app, but there's no reason why this couldn't be implemented as a web application or any other thing. If you want to be really crazy, it could even be implemented as a database application. But at, in general, the following steps are done, right? The user is going to enter input of some sort. In our case, it's going to be through the console window. Based on that input, we got to map it to a command, right? Did they want the rover to move forward, move backward, turn left, turn right? Well, based on that command, we got to figure out what method to call, right? Do we call the move forward function, the move backward function, turn left, turn right, so on and so forth. And then once we've gotten that action, the thing to do, we're just going to pass Rover in and say, hey, here's, here's the current Rover. And then based on what's returned back, we're going to actually hold on, we're going to throw away the old value and hold on to the new value. Sounds complicated, but I promise it's not. In fact, we're gonna implement all these steps. So uh, we're really lucky that um, user enters input, that's console.readline, so easy, right? Probably the easiest requirement we've had this entire evening. So let's take a look at something a little bit more fun. Uh, input is mapped to a command. So let's, let's break this one down a bit. So we just got done talking about how input comes from console.readline. So if it's console.readline, that means it's the type of all strings. So here's a circle that represents uh, all strings. And then here's the new type of all possible commands. And as you can see, there's a kind of clear cut mapping, right? Uh, if you give us an F regardless of case, then it goes to move forward. Um, and you know B goes to move backward, so on and so forth. And you know Q goes to quit. But the cool thing about all strings is that it could be any string. It could even be a platypus. I don't know about you, but I don't know what the rover should do if it's told to told to do the platypus command. So, so what 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 do we do? Um, and I'll open it up for uh, uh, to Matt here. But I'll say, uh, Matt, I didn't mean for you to become my pair uh, pair for the evening, but that's how it's going to be. So, if we pass in uh, this platypus string as an input, what what, what do you think we should do? Um, well, uh, again, my sort of uh, tendency here is to throw an exception. Right. Okay. And and that's probably a pretty fair assumption, right? Hey, you just gave me unexpected input. Well, go enjoy this unexpected exception, right? But we can't do that in this case. And the reason being is because we need to play with the rules of a function, right? That means everything on the left has to be mapped to something on the right. 
And so the problem we have is that input can be any string, but not all of them can be mapped to a command. So what, we, what can we do? Well, we've got one of two choices. We can either re try to restrict the input to valid values, right? So we could somehow try to come up with a type that doesn't allow you to put in the string platypus, but that's really hard. And in some cases, it's not even feasible. The other approach we can take is actually expand the possible outputs or the range. What are possible values you could return back? So in this particular case, we're going to do the second option by expanding the possible outputs by introducing the unknown command. This is our catch-all. This is when you've given us a string and we don't know what to do. So we're going to give you back a command of unknown. So like such. And so if you give us platypus, if you give us kumquats, if you give us couch base, if you give us uh, MongoDB, if you give us century one, whatever string it is, we're going to give you back unknown if it's not something we know what to do with. Cool. And then we'll take a look at uh, implementation for such a, a, a function. So we've got a function called string to command. You give it a string. Using a little bit of newer C sharp syntax, using that, uh, I call it the hot potato operator. I forget the official phrase for it. I think it's the null conditional, where uh, we'll do S. And if it's null, it won't do the two lower. But then after it's two lowered, we'll, we'll pattern match on it. If it's you know, F B L R Q, we return you the correct command. And if it's not any one of those, we'll give you the unknown command. Nice. By doing this type of work, uh, not only is this code super, you know, testable, but it's not going to check exceptions. We've, you know, we now have to deal with the unknown, but otherwise not too bad. So sweet. We've uh, gotten two of our steps done. We now do console read line. We know how to go from a string to command. Oh, now we got to do this command to an action. So once again, we're going to do our groups, right? We're going to have uh, a, this circle of commands or type, and we know uh, the actions are all the functions that can go from rover to rover. So our valid commands are, you know, move forward, move backward, so on and so forth. Now with this new unknown and our possible, um, uh, actions are move forward, move backward, turn left and turn right. And those are the functions we wrote earlier in this presentation. And most of these do a great one-to-one -one mapping, except what should we do if we do quit or unknown, right? We said that those are valid commands now, so we can't really throw an exception. So, so, so what do we do? Well, if if we're writing a rover and it just got a command, we and the command was either to quit or we don't know what to do, we should probably just do nothing, right? Just back now, nope, not going to do anything. I'm not going to move, not going to rotate, just not going to do anything. So here's what that method would look like public stack rover called do nothing. It takes in a rover and it just gives it back right back to you, doesn't make any changes to it. So what's really cool with this approach now is that we actually have a, a fail safe, right? If we get the quit command or the unknown command, we can just say, cool, don't do anything with the rover, just return it back. So I'm going to pause here for a minute and check the, uh, the chat, see if there's any we questions. Do, we here do have one question, Cameron. Excellent. Uh, for function definition, many to one is okay, but not one to many? Yes, absolutely. Yep, you can have many things mapped to the same output. Um, that's okay. Um, it's when you have the opposite problem where one thing can go into one of two values. That's where you're going to run into problems. Great question. Um, and if that sounds um, kind of confusing, uh, if I can lean on mathematics for a minute, the squaring function. If you pass in two, you're going to get the value of four. But if you pass in negative two, you also get the value of four. That's okay. Great question. Uh, that's the only question for now. Wonderful. Cool. So with this in mind, we can now write a, a, no, a new function called convert command to action. So given a command, we're going to run a switch statement, and it's going to look like the following. If it's move forward, we return back the move forward function. If it's move backward, we return back the move backward function, so on and so forth. And if it's quit or... Um, I should have had an unknown in here, so that's a typo on my bad. But if it's quit or unknown, uh, return do nothing. Um, so yeah, so we've got user uh, input from the user, parse it to a command, command to an action. We can now start building up um, 
<clears throat> excuse me, we can now start bringing everything together. So let's take a look at implementing the rover itself, like our uh, implementing the Kata. So here we go. Uh, I've written this little static void function called interactive mode given a rover. Uh, while the command's not quit, I'm going to print to the screen, hey, here's what's current location is, what command do you want us to run? Um, we convert that command, uh, the string to a command, and then we um, do that converters.convert command to action. And this code may look a little bit um, unfamiliar, so let's, let's parse this for a moment. Um, when we can call convert command to action, that's going to give us back a func type, right? The, the, a func of rover to rover. To actually call that function, I could have done open parenthesis rover close parenthesis, but that's a little bit of an unusual syntax. It probably would have thrown a couple people off. I know it would have thrown me off. So there's a method on the func data type called invoke, which will essentially call the function underneath and pass in whatever the inputs are to it. So imagine that this block that's been highlighted is, hey, figure out this function, now invoke that function with Rover. And notice that I'm taking whatever that return result is and storing it back in Rover. So I'm actually throwing away the old version and keeping on to this new version. And so this is actually a form of state management, but it's not immutable because all the mutability is happening in that one line where I'm throwing out the old version and keeping to the new version. So. Cool. So let's uh, take a look at the next. So this is great when you're having to parse the you know input one at a time based on the user. But what if you actually knew all the commands ahead of time? What if uh, the user gave you all the commands in a single string and then you parsed it that way? Let's take a look what that implementation would look like. Well, the cool thing is it's a little bit different, but not too terribly much. So the first thing is we're going to ask the user for the commands to process. We'll read line it. And then we'll print what the rover's current location is. Now, if uh, for those of you who are familiar with Link, you're really going to appreciate this next a little bit. So given an input of, let's say, FFBBLQ, we will take that string and split into individual characters and then convert each of those characters into a string. We'll then convert each of those uh, one-letter strings into their own commands. And then for each of those commands, we'll convert to an action. And then we will aggregate all those actions together by using Rover as the starting state. And then for every uh, uh, action that we want to run, we'll pass Rover into it. So uh, pretty little succinct little workflow here. And once this piece is done, we actually can just print to the screen, hey, here's what the final output is. What's kind of cool about this approach is that once we highlight all the code, you'll note that all the things that would be really hard to unit test, like console write line, console read lines, are totally separated from the business rules, right? All the business rules are in that in the section with the blue highlighting, right? There's an actual phrase for this type of approach. Um, you would know this, um, it, it's got a lot of names, but the first one that comes to my mind is ports and adapters um, from Alistair Coburn. Um, or you may know it as a clean architecture. There, there's quite a few names. But the fact that everything I care about, all my business rules, are totally separated from all the stuff I can't really test, which was console write lines, console read lines. Pretty nifty. All right. So let's, let's focus in a little bit on the link portion. So what's interesting about this is how many times do you think we're iterating through uh, the list? given that there's three selects and aggregate going on. Anybody want to take a stab at it? Oh, goodness. I'm checking the uh, Twitch chat and it is uh, delightfully off topic. It's which devolved into some Star Trek tri discussion and trivia. <laughs> oh, man. Been I was... oh, goodness. Uh, that's okay. Uh, I should have... If I'd known that, I should have uh, totally changed out the topics. Maybe I should have made this the, the enterprise kata, and then so it's Riker delegating commands. Ah, oh, crap, I probably just stepped into a next generation versus. No, I'm going to keep stepping over that. So yeah, uh, fun fact. Uh, this code isn't the most efficient thing in the world because for the three selects and an aggregate, it's actually iterating through that list four times. Eh, not great. Could we do better? Absolutely, we can. So... 
if we look back at what those three select statements were doing, it's essentially doing this, right? Take some strings, map them to a command, then map that command to an action. Well, guess what? We can cheat. We can uh, bypass that middle, uh, the middle step of going to command and go straight from string to action using this th cool thing called, called composition. So if we look at the mathematical term uh, definition, function composition is an operation that takes two functions and produces a third function such that it literally composes the other two, like f of x, then takes the output of f of x, passes it into g, and then that's the new function. Ignoring the mathematical technological terms there for a minute, it's pretty much this. If A implies B and B implies C, then you know A can get you to C, A implies C. So you can actually write function composition in C sharp, not too terribly bad. Um, I'm a huge proponent of using extension methods, which is essentially what the first implementation is. Um, but if you give me a func that goes from a T1 to a T2 and another func that goes from T2 to T3, I'll give you a func that knows how to go from T1 to T3. So we can use this implementation. And once we've got this going, we can do the following. So here is our string of commands implementation from before, but note this really cool change. We, we've created a new function called uh, charge string Right, so if you get a character, give a string. But now we can go from a character to an action by saying to string dot compose, convert string to command, and then compose those two things with a third one, convert command to action. And by doing it that way, we've now actually flattened all the the three select calls into a single select call like so. And in fact, we did it in such a way that um, it's input dot select and then dot aggregate. So we've went from four iterations down to two, but you know what? We could actually go a little bit further. So now that we have a way to go directly from a character to an action, we can get rid of that select and just use an aggregate like the following. So given a rover and we'll pass in a function that says given another rover and a character, go from character to that action, then invoke that action with your rover. So we've now one-lined it. Aggregate's not exactly the easiest signature to parse, but you went from iterating list four times down to one. And the cool thing about all of this is that you're actually guaranteed this has to work because all the types line up, right? Because if at any point you didn't have a pure function uh, or have a function that was guaranteed to always return stuff, your composition would have broken. And um, if you didn't have immutability, that means when you passed in Rover, it could have been modified by somewhere else in your code base, which means your function may not have done what it's supposed to do, which means you couldn't have even done any of this stuff, right? Which is pretty nifty. So let's, uh, let's kind of recap what we covered this evening, right? So we covered three real main concepts. The first one's immutability, right? This ability, um, and by implementing immutability, we, we remove the idea for someone to randomly access to internal state and just make changes to it. And because we reduce dramatically the places where our state can change, we reduce complexity and improve our troubleshooting abilities, which is nice. We talked about functions, right? And how they're just mappings from one type to another and that there's a couple of rules they have to follow. But once you have both those things in play, we can now do composition, right? This grand idea that we can build uh, bigger applications from smaller applications. So let's say you're super enthused and you're like, Cameron, I, I want to go learn more about this stuff. What are some great resources you'd recommend? Well, um, if you're uh, into videos, um, Brian Lonsdorf has done um, a video series, I think on Egghead IO called Professor Frisbee Introduces Composable Functional JavaScript. And it does a wonderful job of talking more about immutability functions and compositions. Um, if you wanna stay a little bit more in the .NET land, uh, Scott Veloshin, um, his Thinking Functionally uh, series of blog posts on F Sharp for Fun and Profit is wonderful. It actually makes you start thinking about designing uh, better systems, more reliable systems. Um, he also has a book, Domain Modeling Made Functional. So some of the stuff we talked about at the very beginning, if that kind of was interesting to you, I'd give that a read. Um, but uh, Professor Frisbee's Mostly Adequate Guide to Functional Programming, that's a free online GitHub book, as in please read it. 
Um, Kyle Simpson has done functional light JavaScript. Um, if you're not familiar with Kyle's work, you might know him from the uh, You Don't Know JS series of articles and such. Um, and all the code tonight can be found on my GitHub called FP Through Construction uh, Fundamentals. So if you want to pull down the code, kind of poke and prod, take a look at it, you're more than welcome to. And on that note, y'all, Thanks so much for letting me uh, speak to you tonight about functional programming concepts. Uh, hopefully you learned something new. Uh, I hear that there is a massive Star Trek uh, conversation I'm gonna have to get into to at least uh, get up to speed on stuff. And I've got one favor for you. If you don't mind, if you will um, either scan the QR code or click the link that I believe Matt has posted in the channel and fill out a survey for me. Um, I'm always looking to improve, right? I'm always looking to and uh, improve the presentation skills and such. So it's one question. I promise it's not too terribly painful, but if you could leave me some feedback, I greatly appreciate it. Otherwise, thank you all so very much. Cameron, thank you very much. Uh, one of the downsides here is we can't all give you a round of applause, but I'll, I'll just give you a little, little clap, a little <laughs> clap. Uh, let me bring myself. I, I'm, I'm, look, I'm, I'm waiting for the chat to blow up, right, with other people clapping. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah get, do it get, again. Those, uh, get those emotes in. I'll, I'll even put the moat wall up so you can all throw your favorite emotes up there on the screen. For, for Cameron. So let me uh, make Cameron a little bigger here on the screen. Yeah, I, I, I right. uh, someone put in uh, big claps. Big claps. Uh, appreciate that. Yeah, yeah, big claps. Here's, clap, clap. here's an example of an emote. I'll just, there are some, there are some emotes flying around. Oh, the there it is. There, there's a flying through. Oh, goodness. That's what Absolutely. we want. All right, excellent. <laughs> yeah, bravo, clap, clap, thank. So everybody, make sure to fill out that form if you would. And there's also a link uh, just in case. Uh, you didn't get some of those uh, some of those slides uh, screenshotted in time. There's a link to other materials uh, that Cameron's provided as well. So please check that out. Are there any more questions uh, at this at this point for Cameron? Just drop those in there. Oh, we got some hearts too. Very nice. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Oh man, I know I'm gonna have to read through all the Star Trek stuff because, like, <laughs> oh goodness. Uh, the Star Trek stuff. I'm not that much of a Star Trek fan, honestly. But uh, I, my brain is just full of useless trivia. Uh, nothing actually, you know, useful or uh, worthwhile stored in there. It's just a bunch of trivia rattling around. And so, <laughs> so the, the robot that uh, they were talking about uh, providing a string to your uh, code that uh, would cause a logic failure in the Star Trek robot. Oh, um, and I, I, for some reason, I know the name of that robot. It's Nomad. So, uh, I don't. That's... Oh, that makes so much more sense. Okay, because <laughs> and then the Star Trek uh, discussion. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh goodness! Yeah, no, I, I am not geeky enough for this conversation. Uh, <laughs> I am not qualified. Well, you actually have useful things like functional programming and state <laughs> machines, all that kind of stuff. I just have you know Star Trek trivia. So, them, them hey, man. Breaks. Uh, uh, teach their own, right? Like functional programming <laughs> concepts are really important right now, but uh, you know what? At Bar Trivia, Star Trek knowledge, probably the big difference maker <laughs> if there. If I win that $10 gift certificate, it's all worth it. All right. So it looks like the, there's one more question. I don't know what this question is, but it says, are you of the body? Hopefully that's uh, a Star Trek reference. Um, if not, that's a functional programming question. I don't know. Sounds like you don't Man. know. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely not. Um, more context required, please. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, uh, oh, it's yeah, it looks like it's a Star Trek reference. Landrew wants to know. So here we go. Swing and a miss, man. Okay. Like yeah. I said, I'm not qualified for this conversation. Yeah, I don't. Uh, that one's lost on me, too. So I don't, I'm not, like I said, I'm not a Star Trek, uh, a huge Star Trek fan. But, uh, oh, it's from Return of the Archons, of course. But I guess it's a Star Trek episode. I don't know. <laughs> All right, so uh, that that's that's going to be it. Of course, uh, you can hang around for a minute if you don't mind, uh, Cameron, just in case someone has another question. Yeah, I can what chill I'll, out for the uh, next 20 minutes or so. Okay. What I will do here is I will bring up the uh, giveaway screen here for our fabulous prizes. And just as a reminder, uh, first place, well, let's start with second place. So second place will be uh, a Star Trek or Star Trek. Oh my God. <laughs> Not Star Trek. It'll be a, it'll be a couch base, uh, sort of grab bag of swag. I was rooting around during your presentation. Uh, I found a messenger bag, a notebook, a uh, water bottle, a bunch of stickers, a pin, some other little gadgety things in there. 
Uh, so I will throw those all in a box and ship them off to you. That'll be second place. First place will be a fabulous JetBrains license of your choosing. Uh, and that is, uh, of course, you can pick ReSharper or um, uh, uh, Writer if you want to, but there's lots of other stuff you could choose. There's uh, Data Grip, there's uh, WebStorm, Team City, all kinds of great things you could you could pick there. That'll be the first place prize. So I will say just one more time, uh, if you want to get entered to win one of these fabulous prizes, go ahead and leave a chat message in there. It doesn't have to doesn't have to be Star Trek trivia. It could be anything. That will automatically <laughs> get you entered to win, uh, entered into the raffle. So go ahead and do that now. Art the of the body. Okay. Uh, all right. So that those all count. And what I've got here is every single chat message that goes into Twitch also goes into my couch base bucket here, and then I'll just write this. Uh, well, I wrote this months ago, in fact, but this uh, SQL query uh, to pull one of those messages at random from tonight. So uh, I'll just give you a few more seconds to get that chat message in. Uh, yes, a free stuff check. And it doesn't hurt to do it, do it once or twice more, just in case. Uh, it's not going to improve your chances, but uh, if, you, if you weren't sure if you put a chat message in or not, now's the time to go ahead and just throw it on in there. Uh, okay, and, and I'll just vamp a little more time by saying, yeah, Couchbase is a NoSQL database storing JSON, but we're querying it with SQL. Pretty darn cool, I think. One of my favorite things about Couchbase. All right, so this first drawing is for the Couchbase swag pack. Uh, you must be in the United States to get this, by the way. Uh, if you're outside the United States, I can't ship this to you. Um, so just let me know. And when I, call your, when I call your name, make sure you tell me that you're here. Uh, so that uh, I will uh, know that you win the prize. And then you can email me your address. It's me at mgroves.com. Or you can whisper it to me on Twitch or whatever. Just give me your uh, home address and I will get this mailed to you. If you're the JetBrains winner, all I need is your email address. So again, you can just email it to me or you can whisper it to me on Twitch. Either way, I will get it and I will get that to you almost immediately. It'll just be a PDF file. Okay. So here we go. This is a uh, drum roll, please, uh, for the second place winner. Winner is Ivan Rainbolt. Ivan Rainbolt, are you there? It looks like you just were in the chat just speaking a second ago. So are you still there, Ivan Rainbolt? Ivan Rainbolt. Just need you to say hello and just need you to, hey, you're here. All right. Congratulations. You win. Uh, you just need to uh, email me or contact me in some way with your mailing address, assuming you're in the United States, and I will send this prize off to you. Congratulations. Okay, now this is for the JetBrains license, all right? Uh, drum roll, please. Here we go. It is me. I win. <laughs> <laughs> woo -hoo, finally, Ooh, finally. Rigged. No, no, rigged. That's okay. <laughs> I, I, will, I will decline. I've got plenty of JetBrains products already. Love me some JetBrains. I use it every day, so I don't need that. I'll hit the execute button again, and it is M Bowlin, M Bowlin, M Bowlin, M underscore Bowlin or Bowlin. Are you still hanging around, M Bowlin or Bowlin? Just say hello in the chat there. Let us know you're here. Everyone's on edge. See if M Bowlin is stuck around. Are you there, M Bowlin? Uh oh. Beeler? We're going to have. <laughs> we're not going to have Bolin. Bolin must have bailed. Change your name to M underscore bailed because Oof. we're not going to win this prize. Okay. You didn't like that one. Okay. Oh, no, no. <laughs> the tension like mounts. Missed out some jet brain stuff, As the man. final moments draws near, may he rest in peace. All right. Going once for M. Bolin. Going twice for M. Bolin. Okay. Sorry. We're going on to the next drawing here. It could be him again. We'll see. It could be me again. V'ger got him. Oh, there's a Star Trek reference. Okay, uh, Brian Simpos. Brian Simpos. Are you there, Brian Simpos? Brian Simpos, just say hello in the chat so we can wrap this up and get you a fantastic JetBrains license. Brian Simpos. Oh, man, this ain't looking good. Oh, no. Oh, there we go. Brian hey. is here. All right, Ooh. great. So, Brian, if you could just uh, give me your email address. You can whisper it to me on Twitch, or you can email it to me, me at mgroves.com. I'll put that in there again. 
uh, and I will get that JetBrain license over to you. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for playing. I appreciate everybody coming out to Condug here. And uh, we've got a little more time if you want to hang out uh, with, uh, with uh, Cameron here. You've got more questions. And now, now he's huge. He's, uh, he's the size of the, of the center of the universe guy from Star Trek V, just to bring in another reference there right now. I was going to say I was kind of a big deal as you made me what, what bigger you on the screen. What you need with a starship? What you need with a starship, Cameron? Okay. Oh, it's, like I said, I'm not qualified. I'm just going to... So many more Star Trek references I can do before uh, we shut her down. All right. So any other questions in the chat there? Engines can't take much more abuse of this. Uh, <laughs> so Miss the Presentation is going to be recorded on Twitch. It is uh, automatically recorded on Twitch, yes. And I will export it to YouTube here within 24 hours. I think that's the policy. Goatee looking good. Hey, it's Mini Wheats. Thank you for the subscription. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry you don't get all the fanfare because this is not a normal uh, Twitch stream. Ah, oh, Liberty Four also oh. says you need to turn in your nerd card. Sorry. You need to you do Star Trek references. No, nah, it's okay. Uh, my nerdum is going to be dad jokes, bad jokes, and board gaming. You, you hit one of those three, we can talk. But uh, mm. uh, <laughs> that's okay, though. It's all good. It's all good. Oh, man. Besides, all, all I know, man. I, that's why I was having to go through the chat because I was like, I don't know. Besides, most of my Star Trek's going to be from next generation. <laughs> Pocket protector will make up for it. There you go. Oh, no, man. That's, that's an L. No. no <laughs> raise your hand if you ever actually worn a pocket protector. Like, legitimately. Because <laughs> I have. Uh, really? Uh, yes, I have. I, I don't really, I didn't really need it because pens don't really, you know, in, in, the, in the older days, pens would leak all the time, right? Right. So you need it, but it didn't really, it didn't really happen. So I think I got it at a conference or something. It was like a free piece of swag, a pocket protector. TNG I rocks. Can... Yeah, we got some TNG fans out there. Yeah, woo woo. It's the only, it, it was the first show I saw. I was like, wait a minute, why is the Ring Rainbow person <laughs> like, right? Like, like in a show, and then is that Whoopi Goldberg? Like, that's all, like, all, all in one, one show, right? So, oh, goodness. Oh. Oh gosh! Oh, you know you warned it, us about this. I I I I, I well, made me I anyway. warned. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, that that would be the sounds of a two-year-old uh, singing the song of his people. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's all good though. That's and then okay. that was and then that was the sound of Mama uh, scooping him up and uh, trying to save him from uh, save me from him doing the Kool Aid Man routine of kicking down the door, going, "Oh yeah!" So that's exactly <laughs> what we would have done. Oh, Ring Rainbow and Seth is done. Absolutely. Mm -mm -mm. All right, everybody. Well, I need to get myself some dinner here, so I'm going to go ahead and, and wrap up the stream. Uh, just once again, thank you very much for Cameron for presenting for us. Um, we're going to try to get an uh, announcement out a little earlier for next next Condug. Uh, I appreciate Cameron kind of doing it on a short notice, um, but Cameron's a pro. I knew he's a pro, so... Uh, I knew this would work out, but we're going to try to do it a little earlier next time. So we have a little more notice. Uh, if you have suggestions, make sure to get those in on email. Uh, if you want to speak or if you have a suggestion for a speaker, it's much easier for us to recruit speakers uh, these days. It's uh, like I say, it's the very thin silver lining in, in the cloud of 2020 is that we can bring in great speakers like Cameron, who's all the way over in, uh, what would you say? Was it North Carolina or was it South Carolina? Yeah, Charlotte. Charlotte. Okay. Yep. So uh, all the way in. Mini Wheats is going to speak. He's the greatest. Uh, sure, uh, send me an abstract, Mini Wheats. <laughs> uh, but uh, I know he's just joking. Uh, but uh, if you have an abstract or if you want to talk about a topic, just send it over to email. I'll pass it around with the rest of the, of the team. And uh, until then, we'll see you uh, in about a month, the next conduct. All right. And uh, that'll be it. Bye, everybody. Thanks, y'all.